different film. It fell apart. We, I was in Vienna. It was October of 2020. I had no idea what I was going to be doing. I didn't have a film to make. I didn't have a, a, a job. I was spiraling into a depression. When Christo walked in one morning, we had a breakfast meeting, and he said, that film we were working on is dead. We can't go back. Um, but there's something else. And I was like very upset. I was ready to fly home to Canada. But then he said, you know that Navalny guy? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, Christo, I know that Navalny guy. What about him? He's like, in a very matter-of-fact way, he's like, oh, I think I have a lead in who tried to poison him. And I was like, Christo, who's making that movie? And he says, I don't know, should I ask? <laughs> I was like, yeah, Christo, you should fucking ask right now. And as we see in the film, Christo slid into the DMs of Alexei Navalny, the leader of the Russian opposition, and a week later, Odessa, Christo, and I were sneaking across the German-Austrian border, listening to his terrible 1980s Bulgarian rock and roll music, <laughs> headed towards Black Forest to meet with Alexei Navalny and uh, his chief investigator. And we found Alexei to be very jovial and, and wonderful, and we found Maria to be the bad cop to his good cop. Um, and she was very, very scary, and she continues to be very, very scary. <laughs> um, but she, she'll tell you more about that. I mean, Maria, you, all of a sudden, there's this, this tall, young Canadian filmmaker there. What, do you, I mean, what did you think when you were first approached by this gentleman here? Come on, look at him. You can probably guess what I thought. Um, he was wearing. Um, I'm sorry, Daniel. I don't know what that means. It's okay, Daniel. It's okay. It's okay. We'll speak later. So. All right. Um, to be honest, all I have to say, he was um, very endearing, and he was so um, enthusiastic and so keen to make this movie um, that. Essentially, it was enough to choose him over very, very famous directors that were in touch with us and promising us things and budgets and awards and all of that. But sometimes, you know, when you meet a person um, and um, you just know, you and we were pretty sure that uh, we were pretty sure straight away that um, this guy will dedicate his whole life, every minute of his time and every effort that he has that will dedicate it to this film and nothing else. And this would probably be the most important uh, project of his life at this stage. <laughs> I added, Forever. At this stage, it's I added <laughs> I, I, and there's so much, so much that is left unsaid in this. And and to be said, we were right. Look, look, look where we are. I think I think he made a wonderful film. Thank you, Daniel. That's the first time you've ever said that. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how the relationship developed. I'm always really interested in you know, with many documentaries, mm -hmm. people are like. How'd you get the access? But sometimes it's it's not the story of gaining the access, but it's the story of maintaining the access and deepening the relationship over the course of making the film. I wonder if you could talk about how you all work together. Well, when we started making the film, we were scared shitless because we had no idea what to expect. We very quickly acclimated to being around this guy who the Russian government really wanted to murder um, and being around all of this German security and all of these police, it, it very, very quickly became normal. Um, and Alexei himself, I think that part of the reason why the film worked is because he and I sort of hit it off um, in a way that just worked. Um, my, my girlfriend, when she watched the film for the first time, what she said was, oh, of course you make a film together. You guys are both sort of like, like to laugh and talk about politics. And, are sarcastic, and, and that's very much how our relationship was framed. And when I think of our time shooting the film, it's it's often the moments when we weren't rolling, of course. We'd go for a walk or something like this, and, and we're arguing about some public policy thing. He is the biggest public policy wonk and nerd on the planet. Like, he's sitting there, he's like, so Daniel, tell me more about the intricacies of the Canadian fisheries. Like, the most <laughs> weird, bizarre thing, he was just into it. And, and I was really, how, you know, I was really engaged to chat with him, and I think we sort of had a very positive relationship. So that's how it began. And then it really changed when we shot the phone call scene. And I think when, when that happened, it was like, okay, we're, we're bonded 
in a way. Mm -hmm. like we've been through some shit together. Um, and, and then, you know, the rest is history, I think. And how about you, Maria? Just sort of having a film crew around and getting to know them better. I mean, what was that, what was that like? Uh, well, my job was quite literally to keep them away a little bit because I think that um, if, if, if it wasn't for me, they would just get a restraining order very quickly in, in Germany just for following Alexei and Alexei's family all the time. Um, to be honest, the guys were very pleasant to be around and I cannot imagine, well, I've, we've never done a film before so I can't really picture myself doing it with anybody else. Uh, but it was very friendly environment at, at, at every point. So we would shoot um, and then just, to be honest, just camera goes off and we continue to, to talk, to chat. Uh, obviously me and Christo would discuss the case a lot and the guys were around. Um, so it was genuinely a very, very pleasant uh, experience. I don't know whether it's always like that or do you at some point start to hate no, people it, who are filming it, you? It always goes great making documentaries. <laughs> <laughs> Very easy. It's it always was, like this one. Yes. It was it was completely wonderful and and, 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 and delightful. I have no complaints. How was your experience, Chris? Well, again, it was my first documentary experience, so uh, I I remember the whole origin story completely differently. It was not smooth at all. Uh, I got a call from a friend um, who said, "There's this guy who really is following me around the world, wanting to shoot a film." about me, can you get him, get him off my back? So I said, sure. <laughs> so I gave him this idea about doing something uh, in Ukraine, and then then, then he was like getting depressed because it wasn't progressing fast enough. So I just said, do you want to do something about Navalny? And he said, sure. So anyway, uh, but at that point, at that point, actually, we cracked the case. And I said, oh, well, actually, this will be a, an interesting film, for sure. Uh, but really selling this improbable mixture of Navalny, who actually had a, some beef with me because I had posted some tweets that were not very flattering earlier, a few years back, and uh, Maria, who has this competing intelligence agency for the people, like a belling cat, but a different one for, for Navalny, so there was never a lot of cooperation before we, we, we met on this case. And then there's this young Canadian director that they had to really prefer or choose over some really, really expensive guys uh, who offered to do it free. Um, I think that was an explosive mix that somehow it worked. So for me, the rest of it was just not doing anything to interfere with this balance. And I think where I agree with Maria was that for all of the filming season, the team seemed like, like in the most literal case, fly on the wall. They, they were there and nobody noticed them until we, it was time for dinner, when we suddenly noticed them and we and had them there. Yeah. <laughs> so I think if it wasn't for this getting accustomed to them as scenery almost, it would not have worked. Huh. So you, you made the film and then you go into the edit. And one thing that was actually, uh, it struck me watching the film the first time just how fast it is. I mean, it's, what's the final run time? 98 minutes? 98 minutes. It, it finished and I thought, it's over? I mean, it's like, this thing feels like things should just be starting. So, like, could you talk a little about how you constructed the film, working with the editors, and thinking through pacing? Because it just, it kind of rocks from start to finish, I think. That coming from you, that's pretty much the best compliment in the world, so thank you. Um, yeah, the editorial process is, it's horrible. It's, it's like, it, it's very challenging. Um, I, I went through every single morsel of footage, every single transcript. I insisted on having every word of spoken Russian in both the archive and the stuff we shot translated and subtitled, uh, which the producers of the film understood was very expensive and ineffective, um, but they did it. So thanks, Mel and I. Um, and and it was really expensive. It was really expensive. It was crazy. Um, but it was just this commitment to like we cannot leave one morsel of film un unturned and, and like to just speak to that like an anecdote that, that that illustrates that is like we were two weeks from locking the film when I was going back through Navalny's 13 hour interview looking for any breadcrumbs we might have missed any rocks that might have been un unturned and that's when I found this sort of off-camera exchange where Maria and Alexei are having this sort of heated discussion after they think we've cut um, and I was like, this is interesting. This doesn't have subtitles on it. Someone didn't do their job. <laughs> and we exported it, sent it to the translator, and we found that little gem that was in the film. Um, but 
we worked with uh, Langdon Page and Maya Daisy Hawk um, and Al Kazanichuk, who are two, three of the finest editors in the world. Um, and it was really a full court press. Um, it was a very collaborative uh, um, process. Um, and uh, it's staggering to me that we did it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how was it seeing the film for the first time? Did you imagine it would be this? Well, that was the plan. <laughs> I, really, I had my, my expectations were high. My expectations are always high, and I probably uh, probably I need to um, cover some of um, Danielle's um, psycho, you know, um, the, the therapist's expenses <laughs> for, for, what I've been, uh, the, for, for the high bar that I've been setting uh, in terms of like you know expecting to see it. But yes, no, I mean we've seen the, uh, I've seen the first version. It was so weird to just see myself on screen. Um, but I don't know, like it's it felt like that we we haven't said so many things in the film. There are so many stories around this main story that sadly didn't make it in it. I think they're fun and exciting. Um, but um, I think that in the beginning of the film, Navalny says, uh, Daniel, let's make um, thriller out of that one, and this is how the film begins. And I think Daniel delivered. Mm -hmm. Felt like a thriller. So we'll turn it over to the audience for a couple of questions in a second, but I was hoping we could talk a little bit about um, what's happening with Alexei, and I believe you have just received some correspondence from you. Oh yeah, I, uh, I got the biggest present of the season. Got a letter from him, uh, Maria delivered it. Apparently it takes two months to get to, to here. And the, um, when I opened it, it had the most me amazing memento and a note. So apparently Alexei received fan mail from somebody in Russia, uh, a, a lady who sent him this postcard, an old 80s postcard, and it has a photo, or the postcard itself has a photo of an old Soviet camera, and the camera model is Moscow 4. <laughs> <laughs> and a sweet note from Alexei here is, um, just one sentence, I'll read it to you. Hi, Christo, um, here's a souvenir from the Red Prison Zone. This postcard was sent by uh, a very nice lady, but as soon as I looked at it, I realized that I'm just a temporary custodian of this uh, beauty and you have to keep it. So uh, I'm fulfilling my mission and I'm sending it to you. Wow. Kisses, Alexei. Wow. Well, it's really nice, but the red zone reference, I mean, um, over the last year, Alexei has been moved from one circle of hell to the next one. and currently he's the only person in post-Soviet history who's been deprived of his constitutional rights to actually have a client to turn a privilege. Um, and the, the very idea that this is possible in Russia just tells you what else is possible there. Uh, it's just that they don't care. Putin doesn't care about semblances anymore. He doesn't care about, he has zero reputation cost. Uh, the war is a good example of, 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 of where he goes when he's in checked. And of course the concern is that um, if he's if he sees that, uh, well, basically he's cornered, he might do something to Alexei that he didn't manage to do before. But uh, Marie is much more in touch with him, so uh, maybe you can, you can share your latest impressions. Um, well, you're a little bit wrong, Chris, though. I am not in touch with him anymore. Um, because up until three weeks ago, we had a way of um, passing letters to, to each other, and, and Kamani was very involved in, in the everyday running of uh, the, our organization, the Anti-Corruption Foundation, and just you know, he had access to news, and he could he could even get Twitter printouts. Hmm. I mean, he would he would respond back in writing, but still, that's that's better than nothing, right? The Russian in Russian prisons, you don't get much. You, like, you don't get calls, you know, you don't get visitors, you don't get anything that you would get here, like. Rikers Island or something like that. It's, and the communication is very restricted, and um, you aren't really allowed even to, to have visitors who are relatives, as as this that that often. So three weeks ago, something started. We don't really know why. We didn't really know, probably until yesterday, why they have decided to make his life so much worse. But essentially, he was moved from um, he's in maximum security prison, so that's the worst prison you can get. All the other guys there, all the other inmates, are murderers who are accused on more than one count. So, mass murderers, whatever you call them. Um, and 
Um, but and they used to live in a shared barrack, twelve people maybe, um, which is, I mean, it's it's not really great to share a place like that with twelve mass murderers, but still it's some company. Um, and um, then um, they moved. Um, they started to, to 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 for some reason to just make Navalny's conditions worse, although nothing has really triggered it, and they moved him to a um, punishment cell. This is a solitary confinement situation, and so he is in, um, but it's not about solitude, it's about the actual place where you are. So it's a room, two meters by three meters, um, the walls are concrete, um, and there's a tiny little window, like there, close to the ceiling, that's all, um, that's all there is. And there are um, three objects in that room, um, a bed, uh, which is um, a weird construction that you can chain up to the wall. So it goes down and it goes up, and in the morning at 6 a.m. his uh, bed goes up and he's no longer allowed to sit in it or lay down or anything like that. There is a stool without the back, and there is a small table. That's it. And, and a concrete wall around you, that's all. <coughs> he's allowed to use pen and paper for one hour a day, but just one hour a day. Uh, he's allowed to read uh, but only one book per term. And term there in the punishment cell itself tends to be around 14 days. So he needs to choose very long books. Um, and um, he's allowed occasionally to see his lawyers. But the problem is that up until three weeks ago, the lawyer's meeting room looks like um, a room separated into sections with a plastic <coughs> glass between them. So they could, um, and there was a pigeonhole you could pass documents through it. So it was a more or less normal meeting. Okay, it's not pleasant to talk through the glass, but you can still have a conversation. And then they have, they, they got rid of the pigeonhole, so you, he could no longer get any papers. So he, cannot, he couldn't get news like this, he couldn't get printouts like this. Uh, it was like this for about a week, and then they have, um, they have applied a non-transparent film to the, uh, to the plastic glass. Um, so now you can really only see his silhouette when you when when they, when he meets his lawyers. Uh, you can hear his voice, and you can see his silhouette, and um, and you cannot pass anything. Um, Alexei made a joke about it on Instagram, saying that he thinks that this is how Catholic confession room <laughs> looks like. Um, but it's it's very concerning, and it's very it's very. Um, I, I don't know what's the right word here, but um, I, yeah, it's it's petty, but it's also very worrying, Chris. Though it's like because they are escalating, and you could tell that every day they're escalating and they're adding and adding more dates in this punishment cell. For for example, not having his shirt buttoned up appropriately, like you meant to have all the buttons done, like you were in trouble, um, and and um, for that you would get fourteen days. Uh, in addition to, 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 to what he already has. And then all that, not holding his hands behind his back when he walks another 14 days. And they keep doing it and keep doing it and doing it. And I would imagine that this escalation has something to do with the escalation in Ukraine and these events are interconnected. That's terrible. Audience for anybody. Thank you in the front.